Merhaba hocalarım. Hello everyone. Uh, we can, I think we can start in a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm just checking if our presenters are here. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll check it. We will check it now. Uh, yes, done. İzin verebiliyor muyuz acaba? Ee, hocalarımızın ses ve görüntü açmasına. Bahar hocam, e, Lemi Baru'yla görüşüyordum da, e, o yüzden e, şimdi izinleri veriyorum. Çok teşekkür ederim. I'm going to give you everyone permission. Uh, sorry for the uh, waiting. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay, I think uh, I'm going to announce something. Uh, Professor Dr. Leme Baru uh, not gonna come today. Um, he said he has a uh, another meeting at the moment. Uh, uh, and actually, uh, we sent him an email, and the email uh, didn't. Uh, yeah. And sorry for today, uh, Lemo Baru is not gonna be with us today. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will be uh, moderating the um, session. So uh, our first presenter is not here, as I can uh, see. Uh, Professor Samia uh, from International Balkan University uh, 
is going to present code of ethics for journalists and its role in establishing the journalistic profession. But I cannot see our, uh, I cannot see the professor. So maybe we can start with the other presentations and then uh, once uh, professor will be here, we can uh, proceed with uh, the first presentation. So the second presentation, uh, belongs to Professor Deniz Bilge Ülker, Governmentality and the Media in Digital Capitalism. So uh, we can start with your pre presentation, uh, Professor Ülker. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much to all of the uh, committee and all of you sharing this panel. Uh, now I will try to discuss uh, on uh, Michel Foucault's governmentality perspective and how this perspective has us to understand the subject constitution in digital capitalist society. Uh, and also I will try to uh, discuss how we can analyze the power relations in digital capitalism. Uh, in this study, uh, I am trying to answer the question of how can governmentality perspective uh, illuminate how digital capitalism works. Uh, as you know, uh, digital com communication technologies uh, have transformed our society in a way that changes its underlying capitalist nature. Christian Fox Fuchs and uh, his colleagues uh, try to understand the contemporary transformation in capitalism by focusing on a single question. How has the process of extracting value from labor changed with the recent digitalism, digitalization of capitalism? Uh, capitalism has been flexible and adaptable to the social systems. With the development of digital media technologies, uh, there have been a new production practice and new products, including user-generated content and user participation and so on. Users of social media, such as YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, using the internet for networking and community maintenance and generation and sharing of content. And uh, this also uh, affects the advertising sector, and there has been a shift from print to online advertising. Work and labor are also main categories for the Marxist analysis of political economy. Uh, so if we are uh, speaking about the digital capitalism, uh, in capital, capital uh, Marx says only worker who is productive, productive is uh, one who produces uh, surplus value for the capitalist, or in other words, uh, contributes towards the self valorization of capital. Uh, according to Fuchs, uh, in his words, the rise of the capitalist so social media, uh, uh, such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, has not rendered the concept of labor time and the law of value uh, superfluous, uh, but is an expression of uh, new qualities of labor theory of value. The more time uh, a user spends on the Facebook, the more profit grows in communication. And the behavioral content data uh, is, uh, he or she generates that is offered as a commodity to the advertiser. So that the more time a user spends online, the more target uh, ads can be present to her or him. Uh, after uh, understanding the uh, mentality of the uh, digital capitalist society, uh, when we come to the governmentality perspective, uh, I want to uh, say something about governmentality. Uh, Michel Foucault introduced the term governmentality during his course on political power. Uh, the term is a semantic linking of governing and the mentality. So that governmentality is not about only power uh, relationship as we understand. Uh, it is about something mentality. Uh, which refers that the only way to study the technologies of power is an analysis of political rationality underpinning them. So that we can say that governmentality is a uh, political rationality. Uh, following the Foucault's theoretical paradigm, uh, governmentality studies offer that governmentality provides us a perspective to understand the technologies of domination. 
from the political government to the forms of self-regulation. In the sense, governmentality has a different techniques, different strategies that has uh, uh, some uh, discursive characters. Uh, what makes Foucault's governmentality uh, valuable today is that uh, it gives us a powerful set of tools to map the process of subject constitution. Uh, I think uh, to understand uh, how the subject is uh, formed, how the subject is uh, constituted uh, by the discursive process, uh, the governmentality helps us to understand this process. It is the discursive nature of this relationship between the subject and the power that uh, I want to make the center of my investigation. Instead of using ideology, uh, as it is known, Foucault uh, focuses on the discourse. He, he didn't um, prefer to say anything uh, about ideology. He always focused on the discourse. And uh, because for him, uh, it is the uh, discourse that power and knowledge are joined together. Discursive practice are characterized by the delimitation of the field of the object and the definition of a, a perspective for the agent of knowledge and the fixing of the norm for the elaboration of the concept and the theories. Thus, each discursive practice in place a play of uh, prescription that it is exclusion and the choices. According to the Foucault, uh, truth, uh, morality, and the meanings are created through the discourse. And so that in every society, the production of discourse is at once controlled, selected, and organized and redistributed around the certain number of procedures. And uh, of course, this can be adapted to the digital capitalist society. The question that Foucault asked uh, may be adapted to the digital capitalist society uh, in these words, uh, uh, how some discourse have shaped and create the meaning system that have gained uh, the status of truth and dominate how we define and organize both ourselves and the world we live in. Uh, and uh, as we know that in a discursive practice, alternative discourse are marginated, excluded, and uh, yet potentially uh, offer sites where the uh, uh, hegemonic practice are being contested challenging and resistant. Uh, digital capitalism has uh, also its own truth regimes, which create its own procedures, legal forms, ways of thinking, norms. Uh, these truth regimes are also uh, uh, forms, uh, has its own forms of subjectivity. Uh, in digital capitalist society, that includes the extensive, uh, extensive use of digital technologies and algorithms uh, is a society that is governed under the new forms of power, new forms of power relations, uh, or we can say or new forms of governmentality. That is the new technologies have uh, facilitated change relationship between the individual and the entities that govern them through the discourses. Uh, uh, the pivotal character of a notion of governmentality is not only derived from shaping people's conduct, but it also carries out its aim and systematic way of each uh, and every domain of society. The idea of governmentality is used to explore the regulatories of everyday existence uh, and that uh, structure the conduct of conduct. Uh, it's given the expression to distinct historical uh, approach uh, characterized by the particular art of government. It can be uh, adapted to the liberalism, it can be adapted to the advanced liberalism, uh, which can be uh, used for neoliberalism, and it can be adapted to the uh, digital capitalist society. So, uh, so that uh, the concept that uh, Foucault tried to uh, understand the power relations, uh, the technologies of self is another important uh, concept that uh, can be adapted to the digital capitalist society. Uh, the technologies individuals act upon themselves and rendering themselves as a subject. Uh, and in digital capitalism, uh, as we say, the algorithms uh, motives and uh, force us uh, to share and to be active in network and always uh, in interaction. 
to the immune interaction. And this makes us a play, uh, play border. Uh, and what Foucault calls technologies of self that individuals act on upon themselves and make themselves subject. Uh, and digital capitalist structure around the like economy, more dislike economy, uh, like economy. And uh, I think this is something uh, emotional here. Um, so that uh, uh, we can say that uh, a final discussion can be drawn, drawn uh, in this uh, governmental perspective. Uh, this perspective uh, provides us how the self becomes subject in digital capitalist society. And the discourse uh, function an important place in this process of subjectification. Uh, subjectification of the self in digital capitalist society. Uh, and I think um, if you want to analyze uh, genealogy of the subject uh, in digital capitalist uh, society, uh, as people uh, say, that uh, we can take into account not the techniques of domination, but the techniques of the self. Uh, thank you uh, for listening to me. My presentation is. Thank you very much. That's a, a really interesting topic. And uh, we can take the uh, questions in the end of the session. And so we can now move on to our uh, other presenters. And now we have a digital transformation in the music industry commodification in Spotify by Iram Alvish. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, let me share my screen. Hopefully, I can share it. Okay. Uh, I cannot fully see your, I can't fully see your screen, but there is a, um, there's another uh, white uh, thing that is uh, blocking your presentation. In my case, I can see it clearly. Okay. So that's okay. my problem. I will try to fix it so you can go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, let me introduce myself shortly. Uh, I'm Irma Elbir, working as a research assistant in the Department of Public Relations and Advertising at Atalum University. Uh, and I'm also a PhD student in Communication Sciences at Hacettepe University. Uh, today, I will talk about the digital transformation in the music industry and the commodification process in Spotify. So the question whether Spotify is a savior in the music industry uh, is critical, but uh, in this presentation, in order to understand the um, two main questions regarding the digital transformation in the music industry, uh, the political economy of Spotify uh, will be tried to examine. Uh, one question is whether how licensed uh, music streaming uh, affects music industry, especially regarding the digital transformation and consumption. Uh, and the other question is uh, about how the relationship between advertising and commodification appears uh, in the digital music uh, streaming platforms. So, uh, Sirius and Bosco uh, divided the uh, music industry in four eras the acoustic era, the electrical era, the cassette era, and the digital tangible era. Uh, the author's uh, division uh, shows that streaming can be included in the digital era, uh, but it seems that streaming uh, has created another part of the uh, digital uh, era. Uh, its impact on the music industry is highly considerable, so there is a massive shift from physical sales to digital downloads and music streaming platforms. 
So the, before the digital transformation, there are different aspects in the music industry. We have CD sales, pricey, uh, bribery in the uh, music industry, limited distribution, and the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, for the CD sales, uh, before digitization of the music industry, um, the cassette era gingered up the uh, industry actually, and uh, it resulted in huge profits for the music labels, uh, but there were problems of limited distribution and bribery in the industry. So the small independent record labels uh, struggled to get their artists uh, played on the uh, popular uh, radio stations. And some of the record labels uh, were known to bribe uh, radio DJs. And we have also Pricey, uh, which is, I am really sorry that my uh, phone is ringing. I'm really sorry. Okay. Uh, let me. Okay. Uh, so uh, when we look at the peer to peer uh, file sharing, uh, the logic of Spotify's uh, establishment and the peer to peer file sharing are really similar. And we can say that the uh, this type of file sharing is actually the first sparkle of digital streaming uh, platforms. And it can be argued that there's a struggle between content providers and the substantial fraction of their consumers. Uh, when we move on to the birth of uh, Spotify, uh, we can see that uh, the algorithms and playlists have revolutionized music discovery. And when we move on to the numbers from Spotify, these numbers are from the Spotify official webpage. Uh, there are 515 million users and um, also 210 million subscribers uh, paid subscription. Uh, and the all time Spotify payouts, the music rights holders are approaching uh, for $40 billion. Uh, so in 2022, for the first time, uh, 10,000 artists uh, generated as this uh, $100,000 uh, on Spotify alone. So the um, revenues are uh, getting higher. And we, when we move on to the revenue model, Spotify has a proven revenue model and consistently brings uh, in billions of dollars annually. Uh, so there is also a premium subscription model in Spotify. Uh, the implementation of a premium subscription model has enabled Spotify to consistently earn revenue from its customers. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, 9 million people who have uploaded any music to Spotify, but uh, 200,000 professional artists building only financial opportunities. So there's also a tweet from a member of uh, music group Portset. Uh, it shows the royalty system in all of the uh, music streaming platforms. And when we look at the, uh, some aspects of this Spotify and questions about these aspects, the first question is about the uh, characteristic of the company. So is Spotify a content platform company, a distribution service, or a media company? Uh, the head of the marketing at Spotify in 2012 Sophia Benz said uh, Spotify was a tech company only distributing content produced by others. But um, if Spotify is classified as a tech company, uh, it will be missed the fact that a core part of the Spotify has been uh, to provide content to audiences uh, and selling those audiences to advertisers. And the uh, second question is uh, about the uh, type of the music uh, 
uh, in Spotify. Uh, music is at the center of Spotify, but what types of content are accepted? How is music uh, defined? Um, so there is a, a phrase in Spotify, music for everyone, but uh, several aggregation services uh, regulate uh, content uh, appearing on different music uh, streaming platforms. And it's hard to upload uh, self-promoted uh, music via different uh, aggregation services. So the music for everyone phrase is actually um, not enough for the uh, case of Spotify. So the question appears, is music really for everyone? And the final question is about the uh, financial and commercial uh, aspect of Spotify. Uh, how can Spotify be positioned financially and commercially? Uh, the um, company operates at the intersection of different markets actually, and um, it results in the Spotify effect. Uh, I will uh, explain the Spotify effect uh, later. Uh, when we look at the content and local characteristic of the Spotify, there are created playlists, uh, local contents, but we have limited entry to the system. So um, there are lots of uh, created playlists uh, in Spotify, uh, and these playlists uh, have enabled it to connect with listeners all over the world. Um, and there is also limited entry uh, so there is difficulty of uploading music personally and sounds that are not considered music content. So um, there are different criteria for uploading uh, your uh, music, but um, if, if it doesn't fit the uh, criteria, uh, you can't upload your music, so it uh, appears as uh, sound. So independent musicians uh, also uh, must work harder to gain recognition and make a living in a crowded digital marketplace. So the Spotify effect is actually the, uh, examines the uh, intersection of different um, areas. So we have advertisement technology and music uh, when we look at the advertisements, Spotify actually targets uh, audiences demographically and in terms of the content variation. And the company provides the data to marketers for a targeting purposes. Uh, and for the technology, um, Spotify can be considered as a technological solution for record labels uh, struggling with pricey. And for the music, uh, as I said before, it changed uh, the music discovery. So Spotify has changed the traditional music release policy, uh, shifting from album drops to singles. Um, so when we look at album sales and digitization, um, we can talk about the death of the CD. So uh, we can assume that the rise of digital downloads and streaming platforms has resulted in the decline of CD sales, but the uh, British phonographic industry made a research in uh, 2015. Um, according to this research, 13 percentage of the members stated that free music uh, from these digital streaming platforms led them to buy CDs, and 19 percentage stated that they tended to buy records. So um, the revenue system also um, shows that music streaming platforms have enabled new revenue streams uh, for music artists, including through uh, merchandise and touring. And the 37% uh, of service members increased the money they spent every month by purchasing other services, according to the British uh, Phonographic Industries research in 2015. So we can talk about the uh, domino effect in the music industry. So the growth of music streaming has led to a re-evaluation of the entire music industry, uh, from the way music is produced to how it is marketed. So there are numbers from the International Phonographic uh, Industries uh, report. Um, I just take uh, three years uh, numbers. 
So it is surprising that uh, although there was a COVID crisis in 2020, the global recorded uh, music market grew by 7.4 percentage uh, thanks to a continued rise in uh, paid subscriptions, streaming revenues. And finally, uh, all of the while uh, we examine this the uh, situation in the Spotify and its uh, different aspects uh, in the music industry, when we move on to the commodification in Spotify, um, we can look at three different concepts. Uh, first one is uh, the audience uh, concept. So the Dallas Simitis study uh, asserted that the audience is sold to advertisers and participation of the audience is necessary in order to uh, ensure that the audiences consume and respond to commercial messages. So according to Simiti, audiences are actually commodities. Uh, and the second um, concepts uh, come from the uh, Mihun. And it is actually the um, criticism of Simiti's uh, argument. So uh, Eileen Mihun uh, argues that the ratings are um, actual commodities. In the case of uh, Spotify, uh, we can think of uh, streams as commodities. Uh, and the final uh, concept is the digital prosumer commodity asserted by uh, Fox. And for this concept, uh, Fuchs actually talks about the process that is not seen as labor. So the um, audiences are creating playlists and um, they spend time uh, on these um, music streaming platforms. And also these playlists are uh, part of the Spotify's um, playlist system. Uh, so while audiences are listening to music, they actually uh, producing different products for the Spotify. So the um, last question for uh, this presentation is actually, and the aim of the um, study is um, trying to find an answer for this commodification process. Um, so which one is the commodity? The song can be commodity, the paid subscription, audience, or the stream. But the discussion about the commodification process in media does not come at a conclusion. Um, and the possibility of more than one uh, true answer can be taught in the back of minds uh, while discussing the uh, digital transformation in the music industry. And here are the references. And thank you for your listening. Hopefully I can stop my share. Thank okay. you very much. It was a really important subject in uh, today's uh, art world, I think. Uh, so thank you for sharing with us your research. And uh, we will have the questions afterwards, after the uh, all the presentations completed. And now I would like to announce our next uh, presentation named Corporate Sustainability Communication and Semiotics Analysis on Digital Advertisements by Professor Emmet Gürel, Bishra Çetin, and Azra Nazlı. Yeah. Uh, you can proceed. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I am sharing my presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my name is Azra. Uh, I am from Mustafa Kemal University. Our topic is corporate sustainability communication. Uh, it is a semiotic analysis on digital advertisements. 
our keywords for this study are uh, corporate sustainability communication, digital advertising, and semiotic analysis. Uh, although organizations are profit-oriented by their nature, they are expected to fulfill their responsibilities towards the society they profit from and to carry out studies related to sustainability. Organizations ensure that they fulfill their responsibilities regarding sustainability with the communication strategy defined as corporate sustainability communication. Uh, there are three dimensions of sustainability, uh, which are economic dimension, ecological dimension, and social dimension. Uh, the economic dimension of sustainability relates to issues such as economic growth, productivity, production and investment. The ecological dimension of sustainability relates to natural resources and the ecosystem. The social dimension of sustainability concerned with the continuity of social values, relationships and institutions for the future. Uh, these are related concepts of corporate sustainability, uh, which are uh, corporate sustainability communication, stakeholder approach, corporate governance, corporate social responsibility, corporate citizenship, corporate performance, and uh, corporate accountability. Uh, the corporate sustainability communication is placed uh, as intersection of uh, corporate sustainability and corporate communication. Uh, with this slide, uh, our purpose of the research is uh, examine corporate sustainability communication studies through digital advertisement. Our methodology is uh, semi semiotic analysis, and uh, we have two research questions, which are what messages do corporate sustainability ads contain? And the second question is, what are the common messages conveyed uh, in corporate sustainability advertising? Our sample of the research is the fellows advertising awards given by MediaCat uh, for 2021. Uh, these are our uh, sample uh, brands and uh, their advertising titles, which are Metro Turkey Saving for Tomorrow Advertising, Artemas Not Without Turning Off the Tap Advertising, Mavi Jeans Blue Change Advertising, and Migros Agriculture is Our Future Advertising. Uh, we analyze uh, our material with uh, a tablet and uh, share those with you. Uh, this is our uh, first picture. It's a frame from uh, our first advertising. It's named as Saving for Tomorrow, which is Metro Turkey's advertising. Uh, this is our uh, table for uh, semiotic analysis of uh, Metro Turkey's advertising film. Uh, in accordance with the research findings, it has been determined that the messages about people as consumers, life, science, productivity, ecological balance, and ecological diversity are emphasized on the axis of sustainability in this advertisement. This is uh, a frame from the second advertising uh, from Artema. It's named uh, as uh, Not Without Turning Off the Tap. Uh, this is our semiotic analysis for this advertising. Uh, it is possible to state that the importance of water, the prevention of waste of natural resources, the reduction of water consumption, the sustainability of life are closely related to the sustainability of resources can be seen in this uh, film. This is a uh, third advertising that we analyzed. Uh, this is from uh, Mavi Jeans advertising. Uh, this is our uh, semiotic analysis table. Uh, it was determined that there were messages referring to the concepts of recycling, waste evaluation, prevention of environmental pollution, benefit to ecological balance, and sustainability. 
This is uh, our last uh, advertising uh, analysis material uh, is uh, Migros Turkey's advertising. Uh, the title of this advertising was Agriculture is our future. Uh, this is the table of uh, this uh, analysis of advertising. Uh, in this advertisement, uh, the main theme uh, was uh, this course that nature is not immortal despite all its richness and that it has limited resources and attention is drawn to the necessity of sustainability for the continuity of Turkey's wealth. Uh, as conclusion, it is possible to state that the themes of production, consumption, efficiency, science, ecology, ecological balance, recycling and sustainability are frequently discussed in this advertisement. In parallel with this, people and organizations with high level of consciousness and awareness, they have an important mission in terms of ensuring the continuity of the ecosystem, efficient use of natural resources and ensuring sustainability. In order to shed light on future research, uh, we have two suggestions. Uh, these are comparative analysis based on uh, corporate sustainability communication strategies of global and local brands can be studied and sector-based reviews of corporate uh, sustainability communication studies can be done. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, these are our references uh, and we will share our results in uh, full text. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation and sharing your research with us. And uh, now we can proceed to the paper Infectious Times, Miss Disinformation and the Pandemic in Greece. Is it possible for journalism to stay healthy? From Professor Pantelis Vatikiotis. Did I spell it right? Yes. I hope I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did so. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you, Professor. The uh, stage is yours. Hello to everyone. Hey, let me share my screen and the presentation here, just to be sure. Uh, okay. I guess that you can see the screen, correct? Great. So let yes. me introduce the journalistic dimension in our panel. And as you can understand out of the title, actually there is an interest here about uh, this very much discussion on mis disinformation and more particularly in pandemic times with a focus on uh, Greece. Actually, this is uh, part of a broader international research uh, project where I participated representing Greece on risk journalism. And uh, the interest here more specifically is about um, uh, to have, um, let's say, a more um, concrete and uh, in-depth analysis of the challenges that have been addressed due to COVID-19 for uh, the journalistic profession. In the theoretical context, actually, we draw on perspectives that uh, address COVID-19 as a critical incident for journalism. So in this regard, we try to check some ideals, uh, boundaries and inconsistencies that may be involved uh, for journalists. So moving to uh, the fieldwork, which actually uh, was a qualitative research conducted in summer of 2021 with 18 interviews. And we try to reflect on the very broad and diverse uh, Greek media scape, especially as it has been formed during the last decade, since 2008 more actually, uh, because of the financial crisis, obviously, there are uh, many journalists who lost their jobs and they initiated their own independent initiatives, uh, digital first, uh, actually news outlets, uh, some of them also uh, following the model uh, of uh, slow journalism. So in this regard, uh, we employed four uh, national newspapers, four TV stations, three private, one public, three commercial radio stations, 
en ten andere zullen we online nu zo het spoed mensen en dat zijn mensen de more independent is long. En uh, in terms of the analysis, we actually draw on thematic analysis, we try to recognize related emerging themes and viewpoints that uh, grouping together uh, the relevant positions and discourses articulated by the journalists in terms of the mis and uh, disinformation. So very briefly, and I will elaborate more in uh, each dimension, the findings actually indicated that there are uh, numerous factors that influence the Greek journalists and how they deal with the mis and disinformation. And starting from the general to more specific regarding uh, how they serve the public and their commitment as professionals, uh, regarding the sourcing patterns, the very value of objectivity, and then moving to the um, very privileged context of uh, the digitalization due, of course, to the remote work. We try to see what happens uh, in relation to digital tools and the social media, what kind of practices they uh, employ in order to check the information, the big data, and of course, issues that uh, uh, came up with the training. So let's have a look very briefly on each one. So in terms of the public service, uh, we can see the problems uh, and the findings uh, suggest that during the pandemic, actually the media failed both to adequately inform the public about the different aspects of the pandemic, and more importantly, to serve as watchdogs for the public's interest. So here the quote give an idea about uh, this organized misinformation and the state uh, actually involvement and to what extent uh, they had the chance to, uh, let's say, elaborate further into the issues they were interested in. So, for the sources, uh, the journalists reported uh, the overuse of institutional sources, especially the government ones, and uh, as such, this prevented them from uh, employing more independent sources and actually this kind of fear and um, hesitation to employ these independent uh, sources obviously is uh, reflected on the quote that uh, you may have a look uh, here and which I think is very representative of this kind of trend. Uh, moreover, when it comes to the very idea of the objectivity, we can see that um, under these special conditions of the epistemic uncertainty regarding COVID-19, what does this mean? What is the impact, the implications? The reporters trusted a lot the authoritative information, which of course had uh, several problems. I mean, due to the physical content constraints, they didn't have the opportunity to ask directly questions, to clarify certain things. And this uh, has an outcome to be more tolerated of, to the degree of uncertainty uh, regarding the credibility of the information they conveyed by the officials. And on the other hand, this kind of putative objectivity was justified by themselves in terms of mitigating the flow of misinformation from the other side. So here again, another quote that mentions that there is too much misinformation, many conspiracy theories actually make them to trust more the traditional, the well-established sources. So, <clears throat> bringing uh, to our discussion the digital contribution and starting with the social media sources, definitely they recognize that they had a very important, uh, let's say, role, especially Twitter, and actually as a means to broaden the range of sources. But if you check on how they did it, I mean, uh, using the social media, we realized that uh, basically they use it more tactically in terms, as they mentioned, to get the pulse of the public opinion, to get an idea and make clear that they keep a kind of a distance. So again, here, the uh, reflection regarding uh, to what extent they enter into a dialogue uh, with the users and to what extent they get the comments and to respond to them, we can see that this is very limited. So, even more importantly, <clears throat> when it comes to how they try to check the misinformation, 
how they respond to these kind of challenges in the digital context. Uh, they more or less refer to the usual, the traditional cross-checking practices, which are the ones they trust and the ones that prevail. So they prefer to follow the traditional ways of double checking a piece of news and carefully choose their sources, rather than employing new technologies like fact checking practices and so on and so forth. And again, here, I think this kind of reflection is representative of uh, their, uh, let's say, approach. This is the only way I think we can help both ourselves and uh, the the audience. So that's why they justify the employment of the cross-checking uh, practices. When it comes to the big data, which is a privileged, let's say, a tool taking into account how important are the statistics, the visualizations in order to give us a very precise and careful picture of uh, what is going on with uh, COVID-19. Uh, most of the Greek journals actually mentioned that there was a very limited access to databases, uh, like uh, the quote mentioned here. And this kind of difficulty to access and analyze resulted in a kind of greater homogenization of the news content. So this is another important, uh, let's say, factor that prevented them from uh, going uh, deeper into uh, the reporting of uh, COVID-19. Uh, moreover, and uh, finally, they emphasize a lot the lack of training, which is very much related with the new let's say prospects, but at the same time, the challenges that were addressed by the digitalization. So both the quotes that uh, you can read here, more or less uh, emphasize how they are not very sure about this kind of uh, new, let's say, uh, techniques that can be used and tools. We cannot be absolutely sure that they are doing it right, for example, and also, uh, they emphasize a lot that they miss this kind of training and um, the practice in order to learn how to check and uh, how to use these new tools, which points out how important it is for the media organization actually to provide this kind of opportunities and training options on the digital uh, skills and uh, tools for their uh, employees. So, uh, concluding and following other, let's say, studies and approaches, which more or less uh, come with a similar conclusion, this work comes to verify that after the outbreak of the pandemic crisis, the Greek journalists placed uh, themselves in a responsible, but at the same time, vulnerable position, and they had to tolerate a degree of uncertainty in information verification and, of course, to rely a lot on the well-established source. Despite the fact that they acknowledge uh, the potential of uh, the source plurality in the digital era, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic actually um, addressed and uh, revealed many diverse sources to be available and to complete to gain access. However, the lived experience of the journalists themselves and all these kind of issues that I mentioned before about the epistemic uncertainty, the fear of being criticized as in inaccurate and the limited access to the databases plus the lack of digital skills, practically it came to undermine this kind of watchdog uh, role of uh, the journalist. So <clears throat> at the end of the day, the findings suggest that journalism increases faced with significant challenges that come to undermine journalism capacity to meet uh, the very civic role and to offer relevant, useful information for citizens. However, we have to acknowledge that uh, all of them, the journalists, uh, highlighted that this is not something new, but uh, this is uh, very much related with serious and ongoing problems of the profession, uh, summarized in terms of the commercial pressures, the increasing political dependencies, and of course, 
due to the crisis, the widespread uh, precarity, which bring further, let's say, obstacles for professional autonomy and uh, the journalistic, uh, let's say, task. So we may conclude saying that the pandemic actually served as a kind of an accelerator of already ongoing negative developments in the field of journalism. And this actually sets further, let's say, challenges for us to look into this kind of prospects and as such to consider the new, let's say, spectrum that has been created. So more or less, this was the coverage of uh, my presentation and uh, sharing the findings with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it was very interesting to listen uh, what is happening uh, more or less in our uh, neighbor country. So uh, it was very nice for us to uh, hear about your research. Thank you very much. Now uh, we will have our last uh, presentation for this session. Uh, from Professor Sanya Adia Balichowski, uh, Code of Ethics for Journalists and its role in establishing the journalistic profession. Uh, yeah. Take the mic, Professor. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry my camera is not working. And I'm sorry for joining late because I thought we were supposed to start at 12.50. It was a mistake that I... Overlap with Turkish time. <laughs> I'm no, sorry no, no. again. No problem. Uh, I will share my screen. You will just inform mm -hmm. me if it's working. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. You can see the presentation. Yes. Yes. yes we can see. Okay. Uh, just to start from the beginning. Uh, so. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Associate Professor Sanya Jaip Velichkovsky. I come from the International Balkan University in uh, Skopje. I'm a member of the Faculty of Communications. And uh, today I will talk about the Code of Ethics for Journalists and its role in establishing the journalistic profession. So the we know as the previous um, participants, I'm sure, already said, we are living in a highly developed technological society uh, that proves that uh, information is of crucial importance, whether it is educational, political, and economic, or information from some other field of social interaction. And when we are living in such a context, the attitude of the social actors involved in the information process towards the ethical issues of their profession is of key importance. So every profession, including journalism, needs regulation by a certain code of ethics in order to serve as a regulator of social interactions and to protect the fundamental human rights and freedoms. So by relying on codes of ethics and professionalism, the journalists can perform their journalistic duties more responsibly and more honestly. Uh, moreover, the journalistic codes protect journalists and the media by serving as a framework for their actions and behavior. So what I'm trying to present today is the role of journalistic codes in the fulfillment of the key tasks of the journalistic profession in general, with emphasis on the situation in Macedonia, where uh, we uh, have accepted two codes, actually, the Code of Journalists of Macedonia, which is the most refer the document by all who are involved in the field of journalism. And in 2015, uh, in the country was introduced the code of ethics of the Macedonian radio and television with a goal to improve uh, the work of the state broadcaster. Uh, uh, social life in general is regu regulated and structured not only by legal, but also by ethical and moral values and norms. And in many cases, these values and norms are not formalized with a legal act. Uh, they are often considered practically as if they were laws. So ethical standards apply not only to people's lives, but also to their professional activities within the society. Um, there are uh, 
professions in which all activities are real, clearly regulated. On the other hand, there are professions in which ethical choices need to be made on a daily basis, and journalism is one of these professions. Uh, henceforth, ethical rules are necessary to facilitate, but also to regulate the manner of behavior of journalists in various situations uh, by building and respecting professional ethics. Uh, the adoption of codes of ethics for journalists in many aspects contributes to the ethical behavior of uh, the journalists in performing their complex and responsible role in the society. Uh, many areas of human activity from when we are talking from private and personal then to the professional life that we are living are intertwined with ethical issues and uh, this is the case uh, with both information and journalism, whose importance and influence in society is obvious, and we don't need any elaborate explaining. In addition to uh, above mentioned, we can also talk about the fact that immediately after the time that we are spending working and sleeping, the amount of time that um, modern men or we are devoting to the mass media occup occupies the uh, third place. Uh, nowadays, when the society is flooded with loads of information, remaining within the sphere, sphere of ethics and professionalism in journalism is uh, a real responsibility and a great challenge for everyone working in the profession. So the role of the media is to protect, protect and promote uh, the general public interest and to be a watchdog of democracy. Uh, we should keep in mind that this obligation should apply to every journalist and every media outlet, whether we are talking about public or private, whether we are talking about local, regional or uh, wider. Uh, although uh, through the years there are a number of codes of ethics that uh, were uh, talked about or written about in addition to various laws that regulate ethical reporting in a precise manner, there is a violation of the, of the same or uh, we can talk about non-compliance with the basic ethical uh, standards in reporting. We uh, can actually, we were actually witnesses of this happening uh, last uh, two weeks, so last 10 days with the situation that happened in Belgrade. Uh, therefore, by violating the fundamental ethical principles of the journalistic profession, the purpose of which is primarily to present true information of public interest, leads to an unenviable situation causing mistrust and distress in the public. Also, media workers who in their work are not re respecting the ethical principles uh, by journalist associations undermine the credibility of uh, the profession of the journalist. Um, throughout history, many international principles and declarations of journalism have been created. Uh, the first professional codes of ethics for journalists appeared in the early 20th century. The Society of Professional Journalists, or SPJ, formerly known as Sigma Delta Chi, is the oldest organization that is representing journalists in the United States. Uh, they were founded um, April 17, 1909 at uh, Depew University. And its charter was designed by William Mehari Glenn. So the first uh, code of conduct was compiled in 1926 by the American Society of Newspaper uh, Editors. And uh, the American Kenyans of journalism were influenced by uh, the concept of a free press. So the freedom of press was in the essence. Uh, then we can talk about the Munich Declaration of the Duties and Rights of Journalists that was adopted by six journalist unions and six European Union countries uh, in 1971, which states in its preamble that journalists' responsibility to the public is a priority over uh, the media owner and the government. So basically the truth is above everything. Uh, then we can talk about the UNESCO Declaration on Fundamental Principles concerning the contribution of the mass media to strengthening peace and international understanding, to the promotion of human rights, and to countering racialism, apartheid, and incitement to war, uh, which was followed by the adoption of the international principles of journalistic uh, ethics. Uh, in 1983, uh, at a meeting of uh, professional journalism organizations in Paris, uh, representing more than 400,000 journalists from uh, all around the world. 
uh, these principles uh, still serve as ethical guidelines in media reporting. And finally, media ethics exists to establish responsible media action. These principles still serve journalists as ethical uh, guidelines. Uh, moral ethics includes norms that uh, prescribe certain rules of uh, professional ethics, uh, which, uh, when we are talking about journalism, include the um, person's professional qualities, uh, communication with sources, sources of information, with other journalists, and of course, the environment or the surrounding. There are difficulties uh, when we are talking about journalism in terms of regulating ethical standards, because professional journalistic ethic is not established by law, but is accepted and supported through public judgment, principles, uh, rules, and norms of moral behavior of journalists. Uh, and there are certain rules and principles of proper working and behavior, but they are influenced only by the integrity and morality of the journalist himself. So when we are talking about ethical functions, uh, they are divided into three areas. The positive function, which is the limit of moral behavior through uh, facts, procedures, and their analysis. Uh, the regulatory function, which is the critical analysis of society by analyzing and uh, justifying the needs of society for any norm of behaviors. And the evolutionary function, which is the demonstration of the application of the morally positive and the morally negative. In journalism, contacts are directly involved or are part of the scope of action. Uh, henceforth, moral encourages media employees to self-analyze and suggest other criteria according to which it can be implemented. Uh, when we are talking about international ethical principles, principles uh, the provisions of the code are serving as an ethical roadmap for media workers to balance reporting. While they are reporting, they need to respect fundamental human values. Uh, although they are very useful for journalists, the codes also require the ontological education of journalists. So the ethical action of journalists is uh, achieved primarily by initially informing about media ethics and then by applying and behaving according to their own moral principles. According to these, we may say, seemingly simple principles, every journalist should work respecting basic human values. Um, Claude Jean Bernard outlines five simple principles that media professionals should adhere. Uh, the first is to respect life. The second is to promote solidarity between people. Next is not to lie. Uh, the fourth is not to appropriate other people's goods and uh, not to inflict unnecessary uh, pain. Uh, according to John Lunkarn in 2016, uh, in his work in 2016, there are six basic principles of uh, professional ethics. Uh, the first is to show respect for people because our behavior is uh, mutually reciprocal. Thus, the more we can treat others with respect, the better our lives will become. Uh, the second is tell the truth. Uh, this is another simple idea that grows rather complex on examination. Uh, maybe do not tell untruths is a good and solid rule that works most of the time. Uh, next is uh, primum non nocere or uh, first do no harm, which is a core value and another simple precept to understand, but very difficult to practice because sometimes as journalists, uh, we can and we must harm people with our work. Uh, next is always act when you have the responsibility to do so. Uh, in an earlier art, uh, article, this author uh, talked about diffusion of responsibility as a cause of unethical uh, behavior. Lord Action said, all that is necessary for evil to prevail uh, is for good men to do nothing. And this is something that we are witnessing uh, every day. And the last one is obey the law, which seems as a simple principle until we uh, examine it, because the basic question posed is what is the law? The law as we know it is so large and complex as to be almost unknownable even for attorneys, uh, the, rather less the journalists, and it is always uh, changing. Uh, 
the Association of Professional Journalists in the Code of Ethics uh, that was updated in September 2014 defines the principles of conduct of professional journalists and uh, categorize them as uh, search for the truth and report on it, which means that uh, journalists as professionals should be honest, fair and brave when gathering information, interpreting and writing about it. Uh, they should minimize the harm, which means that they should uh, respect the ethical norms, treat their source and the participants in the events, and also their colleagues as human beings who deserve respect. Be independent in your actions, uh, which means that they must not have any obligation to represent someone's interests. Uh, their only obligation is to be the first to be informed and be responsible, which means accountable to your followers, listeners, viewers, and uh, colleagues. Uh, international ethical principles imply that people have the right to be informed. Uh, we need to receive accurate and comprehensive information. Uh, everyone can freely express their views through the available means of mass communication, as we are seeing every day, as well as through other forms of social interaction. Uh, the facts in the informative contents must be factual and accurate so that their true meaning could be preserved without any distortions. So the media employees should make every effort to ensure that the audience will receive enough information to create an accurate overview of the reported event. Uh, the journalist has a social responsibility. While the information should not be treated as mere transactional commodity, it should be seen as a public good. So the journalist is obviously responsible for the information transmitted to the editors and the owners of the media, but above all, he is responsible to the society. And this responsibility is postulated through the adherence to the journalistic moral and ethical principles. Uh, next, it is essential that the journalist maintains its professional integrity and it is widely assumed in the professional journalistic communities that a media employee has the right to refrain from, from work that is contrary to his or her basic beliefs and devoting to uh, journalistic professionalism. Uh, the journalist should respect the privacy and the dignity of the person. They have to defend the international human rights, including uh, their own reputation from slander and false accusations. They should respect the public interest, the democratic institutions of society, and the norms of public morality. Um, and the journalists should try to prevent armed conflicts and other occurrences that stop the advance of humanity. Uh, journalistic duty is also to preserve and strengthen a peaceful relationship between states and nations. Uh, when we are talking about journalism ethics in Macedonia, uh, each country, and therefore uh, Macedonia also, which is building a democratic society that strives for the development of a free and democratic society, needs independent and ethical journalism based on unbiased, accurate, and comprehensive information. However, uh, there are many available examples in which uh, journalists act in completely opposite direction, and this for sure emphasizes the need for a more prominent presence of ethics as a central pillar for the forming and presence of uh, real journalism. Uh, the main task uh, of journalists is to respect the truth and the right of the public to be informed in accordance with Article 16 of the Constitution of our country. Uh, which guarantees the freedom of belief, conscience, thought, and public expression of thought, freedom of speech, public uh, appearance, public information, and uh, free establishment of public institutions for public information, free access to information, freedom of in receiving and transmitting information, the right to reply in the media, the right to correction in the media, the right to protect the source, and... Uh, according to this article, censorship in our country is prohibited. Uh, the principles and ethical values in this code are uh, regulated in 17 points. And the final provisions stipulate that the journalists who work in accordance with this code have the support of their media house and their professional organization that hire them. Also, journalists will accept the judgment in relation to their profession only from their colleagues 
and they should not be under political and other influence. Uh, this code was uh, adopted in 2001, and while in 2001 about 60% of the population trusted the Macedonian journalists, uh, therefore the media, 10 years later, mistrust reached a staggering 70%. So uh, in only a period of 10 years upon the um, uh, adoption of this code, the mistrust raised to 70 uh, percent. Meanwhile, meanwhile, various influences on the media lead to a situation in which professional standards and ethical journalism become concepts to which almost no one refers anymore. So in order to achieve the goals of the Association of Journalists of Macedonia and above all to protect and promote professional standards for journalism and freedom of expression, uh, in 12, uh, 2012, a handbook on ethics in journalism was prepared, uh, which supports uh, the needs of the Council of Honor of the Association of Journalists of Macedonia, as well as for all journalists who should continuously adhere to the good practices of journalism contained in the code. So this handbook is a practical guide um, to recommended guidelines for professional journalism in a multi-ethnic environment as we are which can be a valuable asset also for journalism students, media owners, and the general public to recognize what is good journalism. Uh, the manual, among other things, points out the most common violations of the Code of Journalists of Macedonia, which includes uh, publishing unverified and inaccurate information, names and data, as well as information with a hidden agenda or bias, disrespect for privacy and pain, abuse of information about minors, uh, disrespect for the right to presumption of innocence, offensive language, etc. Uh, the handbook also deals with self-regulation, the principles of journalism, and in addition to the code of journalism, we can mention uh, the sections about uh, journalists against corruption, hate speech section, diversity reporting, instructions for reporting and informing about minors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as part of the conclusion, it should be emphasized that while working on this handbook, the authors have been constantly guided by two principles that should guide all journalists who are striving for high professional standards in their profession which are be constantly on the alert and uh, learn for life. Uh, in addition to this code of journalists of Macedonia, which is the most referred document uh, by all uh, journalists or all people involved in this field of journalism, in 2015, the country was introduced the code of ethics of the Macedonian radio and television with the goal to improve the work of the state broadcaster, uh, which is Maratava. Uh, this code was a part of uh, Persian negotiations, uh, and it's, uh, it establishes the rules for professional and responsible work of uh, the employees of uh, Maratava, as well as professional standards and ethical principles, mainly in the creation of the program and other audiovisual products. So the code covers the independence and impartiality of journalists in their work. Furthermore, uh, when we are talking about terms of information, this code proposes facts and verification of information without using expressions like, uh, it is said that, uh, we have heard that, they speak about that, some claim that, where unilateralism is strictly forbidden and the other side must be heard. So when we are talking in terms of political reporting, the views of both the government and the opposition must be equally expressed. Although this code of ethics of Maratava has uh, often been uh, criticized above all for its scope because uh, it contains uh, 85 articles, the initiative for special regulation of ethical behavior in the public service is positive and uh, very constructive. Uh, we can note that the code is also burdened with provisions that are not in the domain of journalism and deal with the internal editing of Murtava to a great extent. So one of the remarks refers to the fact that the civil society and the role of the public service in this area are not defined anywhere 
nor they are mentioned as an obligation. So regarding this code, the question arises whether it will be sufficiently functional and operationally applicable in everyday dynamic work of the journalists who are working in Maratava. Uh, so in order to be more functional and applicable, uh, this code should be structured in uh, two different and independent units. The part which regulates the professional standards of journalists and refers to a series of other acts in this field. And the second part, which will apply to the employees we, that include the editor-in-chief, the director functioning and coordinating with the union, and etc. So to conclude, uh, in North Macedonia, the principles of conduct and ethical values in the behavior of journalists in the performance of their duties, as I mentioned uh, before, are regulated by two codes. Non-compliance with these codes of conduct set out in the handbook include, uh, as I mentioned before, publishing uh, unverified, inaccurate information, names, data, and biased information, disrespect for privacy, abuse of information, etc. So, um, we need to talk about and we need to think about future activi activities uh, aimed at minimizing or more precisely eliminating this uh, phenomenon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. It's always interesting to hear about this research internationally, especially countries that are uh very close to us you can see how similar or how different uh, our situations are um so thank you for sharing with us and now i think uh, yes we have finished all our presentations and we have time for questions so if uh, are there any questions uh, we can have them right now Hello. Hello, Professor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. I thank. Uh, I thank for all presenters for these uh, really valuable presentations. I will start with Sanya, the last uh, presenter. Uh, uh, if I heard correctly, there are more than eighty articles in the uh, ethical code, right, Sanya? Can you hear me? There are 85 articles. 85 articles. Yes. In the, okay. in the original code of ethics that is accepted by all journalists, there are 17. In this code of ethics um, of really, Maratava, there are large, 85. Okay. What happens when journalists do not uh, use, do, do not apply these uh, principles? Uh, if they uh, do some misdoings, what happens to them? Ms. Rongs. As I said, they uh, they are just um, responsible to the public and to they can refer to the their colleagues what they are uh, commenting to them. Uh, we haven't had any cases of. Uh, is, is there is there any any body to overwatch these ethical codes or just? I mean, they are just written quotes and nobody uses yeah. it. They should be, they should be obeyed by all journalists and they are uh, watched by the um, uh, um, journalistic association of Macedonia, but uh, with uh, repercussions, we haven't heard of any. Okay. Thank you. I, I I would like to also ask a, a similar question to Pantelis, to Professor Pantelis. Uh, I think the Greek media and Turkish media is very similar as far as I follow. Uh, and probably the attitudes are quite similar. Uh, what, uh, what do you think that, um, do you, uh, do you watch Turkish uh, media coverage as well? I mean, do you have any idea about Turkish media, Pantelis? As far as I know, you have come to Turkey for some conferences uh, before, right? Yes, and 
I was actually working in Turkey for 10 years. Oh, really? Okay, so you know <laughs> Turkish media as well. Um, uh, what, what do you think about the uh, earthquake uh, coverage uh, in Turkey and Greece? Uh, um, for the same uh, crisis coverage, I, I think. Yeah, I guess that all of us, I mean, we can understand that uh, when the time comes with this kind of crisis, with the earthquake and uh, with the train, uh, uh, the accident that we had in Greece, uh, there is this kind of approach uh, in terms of the coverage by the media, by both countries. And uh, this creates some hopes, let's say, that uh, the coverage can be changed. I mean, to be, uh, let's say, objective cannot be in any case, but uh, to, to highlight also the positive aspects uh, regarding uh, the two countries and uh, what is happening on. So it creates at the moment, it seems that we are on this side that- uh, You think you take those the quick jump short by you? Pardon? Okay, uh, so it seems that um, at the moment we are on this, uh, let's say, time, and hopefully it will be it will bring some fruitful, fruitful, let's say, outcomes. Uh, there are initiatives that I know during these years uh, that I was in Turkey, and uh, before that, uh, journalists are coming together from both countries under the umbrella of peace journalism, and they try to. Have you attended any uh, Turkish Greek journalist uh, meetings in the past? The one I mentioned is uh, in terms of uh, under the umbrella of peace journalism, where uh, Turkish and uh, Greek journalists have come together and they try to understand uh, the <laughs> and the bias uh, both sides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have other questions? I guess not. Okay. Dennis is my student from uh, really? uh, Eastern Mediterranean University years ago <laughs> from Cyprus. It is nice to see you, my professor from undergraduate, uh, Sereman Hoca. Uh, it is very nice to see you. It was really uh, good to see you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sharing your research with us. Uh, this session, uh, uh, Professor Levi Baruch was going to moderate this session, but uh, he couldn't be here. So uh, I took over at the last minute. So thank you for uh, also bearing with me. And uh, it was very nice to listen to all your uh, research. Uh, I was very glad. And I hope to see you again in our uh, future conferences. We wait you here in Istanbul next year. Yes, Monteris. we and hope. Sonia. <laughs> we hope. Yeah. Come to Istanbul. Thank you. Hopefully. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank bye you. bye. Bye bye. bye. Dear professors, I'm going to end this meeting. Thank you for your attention and your, for your presentation. Thank you.